Looks like uh, most of you are here, so we'll go ahead and set our motivation. Oi sange chudam sogi chunam pai janchu padu dane kapsu chi dagi chunyan ki pe sonam ki rola penje sange drupa sho sange chudam sogi chunam la janchu padu dane kapsu chi dagi chunyan ki pe sonam ki Rola penje sange drupa sho sange churan sogi churan ba jan chu padu dane kapsu chi dagi chunyan ge pe sonam ki rola penje sange drupa sho and just taking a moment and letting that motivation sink in. Okay, so welcome back. Uh, yesterday we were looking at the Seven Lin Prayer and looking at the Medicine Buddha Puja specifically. And um, the short recap is that the Seven Lin Prayer that we talked about in some depth is a practice that comes up again and again in the Medicine Buddha Puja, but it also comes up again and again in pretty much every practice in Tibetan Buddhism. So it's a, a really good way to set the scene internally. It's a really good way to set the scene kind of externally when combined with the six preparatory practices. And it's something that once it's familiar, you can do it quite quickly and it still has a lot of oomph and depth. So the seven limb prayer we talked about a bit. Um, we also talked a little bit about how we start with refuge in bodhicitta and the four immeasurable thoughts, but those two prayers are probably more familiar and more easy to understand. And so we didn't talk about them quite as much. Um, and then when we did the medicine Buddha puja, you might have noticed that I paused at different parts in each of the medicine Buddhas. So there is a kind of a repetition of doing one of the medicine Buddha's names seven times, some sort of praises to them, and then a very brief seven limb offering and continuing on with more prayers and praises. And what I did was sometimes I'd take a moment and we'd focus on meditating on rejoicing. And sometimes we'd take a moment and meditate on offering, sometimes confessing, sometimes requesting, beseeching, and always doing all of them, but just kind of tapping into one to really emphasize. In some ways, it can help act as sort of a circuit breaker if you get too much on a roll with the recitation that you stop thinking about what you're saying you can if so if you're interjecting different points of pause and contemplation it can make sure you're staying really connected to the meaning of the words not just the words it's a, also a way for you to kind of make sure that you are bringing depth to the practice while still continuing at a relatively quick clip so some chant leaders will just recite straight through without any pauses until you get to the mantra recitation section. Some uh, chanting leaders will pause at different parts, maybe to visualize the Medicine Buddha visualization and streams of nectar coming down and healing light and things like that. So there are many, many correct ways. Um, there's a lot of different ways to approach doing a puja, either by yourself or in a group. But now that it's kind of fresh, do you have thoughts or questions that you wanted to ask about Medicine Buddha Puja or Seven Limb Prayer? Um, so far. Yeah, Christine. Oh, good morning, Venerable Yangtin. Thank you for everything. Um, I have two questions. The first one is in regard to you mentioning it's better to recite the pujas and the prayers out loud. So two questions about that. Number one, why? And number two, is it okay to do what they call like, I think the theater, you know, like a, just a whisper as opposed to the mm -hmm. actual vocalization or is one better than the other? And again, why is that better as opposed to just doing it mentally in the head? And then I have another question after that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a good question. And when you're doing sadhana practice as opposed to puja, it's a little bit more flexible. 
Sadhana practice, which is much more meditative. As a beginner, you say it out loud, becoming accustomed to it, learning the structure and the detail, pausing at different parts, but eventually you get to tell it's just under the breath. And it might be that some parts like the visualization you don't say out loud, you just visualize them. Pujas are off are usually done in a group um, and part of the group energy is synchronizing verbally. But one of the big benefits to saying the puja out loud is that it purifies negativities of speech. And for wow. us, polite, friendly Dharma people, probably our main negativities are through speech, right? We're probably not serial killers. We're probably not embezzling a whole bunch of money. But what do we talk about? You know, <laughs> that's probably like where a lot of our negativity happens is speech. So when you're saying prayers aloud, it's purifying negativities of speech and it's accumulating positive speech karma so that our words, when they are true and beneficial, have more weight. Because the words that we're speaking are sacred speech. You know, the Medicine Buddha Puja is drawn directly from the Medicine Buddha Sutra, directly from enlightened beings. The mantra is directly from enlightened beings. And so by getting into resonance with such kind of high speech, we're really giving ourselves a lot of power for our own positive words. So sometimes I think about how, um, you know, we've all had those times in our life where we've kind of gotten the courage to say an important thing, like in a family situation or a workplace situation. And the effectiveness of that speech in those important moments when you've gathered your courage isn't necessarily about how true they are or how important they are. Sometimes the weight comes with how much karma you've created for your words to be taken seriously. And yes, tone and socialization and social, you know, sort of currency and all that stuff plays a part, all that psychological stuff plays a part. But I, I often think about how those times where it's important that you're heard, we want to create the conditions to be heard. And one of those ways is to say sutras aloud and say pujas aloud. So basically speech karma and group synchronization, group togetherness and building that momentum as a group are the two main reasons to say out loud. Um, whispered is fine. Whispered is totally fine. Um, if you're in a group setting and you're feeling a bit self-conscious or the speed is a little bit faster than you can say aloud because it's less familiar or English is your second language or something like that, you know, don't feel like uh, pressured or you're doing it wrong if you don't say it out loud. That's totally fine, you know, but it's more like if you can, try to. If you can't, don't worry about it. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. But in the case of sadhanas, there's a bit more wiggle room. There's less pressure to say every bit of it out loud because it's more of a meditative experience rather than a puja, which is kind of merit accumulation, praises, etc. focused. All right. Thank you. The second yeah. question is, um, thank you for providing the sutra of the Medicine Buddha. How beautiful to read the, the original sutra. So I started reading it and was immediately elevated in my energy i could feel that so thank you and it says that it keeps saying you know all all these such deluded persons not only follow wrong no it says yet if they succeed in hearing the name of the medicine buddha they will abandon their evil conduct forthwith to cultivate wholesome ways and thus avoid descending into upon the evil paths and they say that for all the 12 mm. vows so i mean I say these things, but that doesn't happen to me. So what does that, what does that mean if they, if they just hear the name of the Medicine Buddha? That must symbolize something deeper than, what does that mean? Well, you know, karma is extremely hidden phenomena, so I'm not going to give you probably the most satisfying answer in the world, but think of it a little bit like the way images and words get imbued with power based on how society views them, based on how people use them. Like for example, the word love has significance and resonance to everyone, but the way it lands is going to be individual based on our own relationship with that word. Like uh -huh. for example, when I'm in Australia, if someone says to me, I love you so much, 
it's a really big deal. Like, like they have like built up a friendship over many years and trust and, you know, some sort of devote, like it's a big deal for someone to say, I love you. In California, they just say, I love you, like a greeting, like a goodbye, like love you, you know? Like, you know? It's, so so it's, it's one of these things where it does have power, kind of quote, from its own side, not inherently, but from its own side, but it also has an individual resonance. Similarly, okay. similarly, the medicine Buddhas, their names have power based on what they brought to their names, but also our relationship and receptivity to them, both directions. So if you're saying these names, it's going to have some benefit on whoever hears it because of the power of the beings that created the names, but how much benefit is going to be based on how receptive that being is. So, you know, do you remember those experiments they did with water years ago, um, where they would have like one glass of water and they would say, oh, I yeah. hate you, I hate you. And the yeah, other one, yeah. I love you, I love you. And then they yeah. put it into the microscope and the yeah, I love yeah. you water was all beautiful. <laughs> and it felt like, like the water is not sentient, it doesn't know. <laughs> but there was a power in the intention. And if you say to your cat or your dog, I love you, I, or I hate you, they're gonna feel it even though they don't understand English, right? They'll feel what that means. So when you're thinking about the power of the Medicine Buddha mantra and the power of the Medicine Buddha names, it's a similar sort of thing of the vibration that's been created by the beings who made those mantras and names is part of why it's so powerful. And it doesn't even have to be in the language that they were when they, you know, sort of came out as Buddhas, right? It can be in any language, but the resonance is there. So it is a little bit of a hidden phenomena, but um, the short story is it's through the power of their prayers that their names have power. Yeah, I did. I did like that. So thank yeah. you. <laughs> Yeah, that so was you very just have like peripheral ideas that we somehow resonate with just from our life. You yeah. can bring some of those ideas in, but know that there's more to the story because we're talking karma and it's just so incredibly elaborate that our little ordinary minds can't quite suss it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Thank you. So you, you will hear Lama Zopa Rinpoche say things like from the side of the object from the side of the holy object, from the side of the mantra, from the side of this, from the side of that. And it can make you say, what? Isn't everything empty of inherent existence? Doesn't nothing exist from its own side? And there's no contradiction. What he's saying is from the side of the object, there is this power because of what the object brought to it. So it's not inherent power. There's always causes and conditions that create the power behind why holy objects are more powerful, why mantras are more powerful, why Buddha names are more powerful. They're not just like magically more powerful. There are countless causes and conditions coming together to bring that power to them. Yeah, are there other thoughts or uh, questions about Medicine Buddha Puja or the Seven Limb Prayer? Yeah, hi. Um... Yeah, thank you so much for this. It's really filling in a lot of gaps already. Um, so much appreciated. I was just uh, paying attention when I was looking it over last night to the mudras that mm. each of the uh, medicine Buddhas do. And I've just always wondered what the significance of those are. Because, I mean, we're told the name, we're told the color, mm -hmm. we're also told the mudra as well. Yeah, and you'll find... Um you'll find slight variation in how the mudras are depicted and slight variation yeah. in the color. And um, Lama Zopa Rinpoche checked with His Holiness's office and His Holiness's office had a look through all of the main ritual texts. And it's basically ways to distinguish one from the other. You give them certain gestures and certain colors so you can tell them apart. That's the kind of really, like sensible reason really like you know matter of fact reason it's to be able to tell them apart oh is he gold or is he yellow let's just decide so we can pick him out in a crowd right in the buddha lineup you know because that helps us direct our thoughts and intentions 
towards that being and towards that archetypal energy that he embodies and represents. So that's the logistical reason. The mudras themselves, um, they basically are going to be representations of the specific emphasis of that Buddha. So you'll see repeated mudras, like many Buddhas have the mudra of fearlessness or the mudra of giving protection. Many have the meditative mudra. So it's not like they're the only ones that have those qualities, but there's something about the gestures that the iconography is indicating that is saying, here is emphasizing protection or here is emphasizing meditative concentration. So um, there's a really excellent book by Robert Beer um, called something like Tibetan iconography or motifs or something. And it's on your recommended reading list at the bottom of the PowerPoint that you'll get sent later. Um, and I really recommend that for all the what is what and what is this and why that flower and how come that conch and all that cool kind of symbolism. So it's a very good question, yeah. But uh, basically it's indicating qualities, short answer. And so you can tell them apart. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, other questions and thoughts? Is it um, better when you're reciting the mantra? I mean, obviously, if you're still learning it, you have to go slowly. But once you learn it, is it better to do it slowly or quickly? Or is it all just a matter of personal preference? The, the speed should be kind of what's going to hit the zone for you of quick enough to keep you perky and focused, but slow enough that you don't get tense or tight. You know, so if you go too fast, you can kind of give yourself some anxiety and some tightness. But if you go too slow, you can get kind of into a dreamy, vague sort of la-la land space. So kind of whatever speed it is that's gonna keep you tracking in a focused way. And you don't wanna ever be so fast that you can't hear the individual syllables coming out of your mouth if you're doing verbal recitation. But later when you're a more advanced practitioner and you're doing the various Kriya Tantra practices like the yogas of abiding in fire and abiding in sound and the yoga, you know, all of these very cool kind of, um, I guess, related to vase breathing. And you know, there's all sorts of groovy stuff you can do with lower Tantra practices where eventually the sound of the mantra kind of blurs into one and it's just in your head and you're not even saying it out loud. But in the beginning, hear each syllable and go at a speed that's gonna keep you focused. Yeah, yeah. And, and you'll hit a zone eventually once you're used to the mantra. Um, if you're doing the, the retreat, the approach retreat, it is helpful to be able to go a little bit more quickly so that you're not, um, I guess, feeling the pressure of finishing the mantra accumulation that's required for those practices. So, you know, a medicine Buddha puja, or excuse me, a medicine Buddha retreat usually takes about three weeks to finish the whole approximation. Um, I, wa I wanna say it's 600,000 mantras, but I'd have to double check. Um, it takes about three weeks. So like that. So to be able to do that, you want to be able to, you know, you know, you want to be able to go pretty quick, but builds over time. Did you get hung up on any prayers or um, kind of stuck at any parts that felt strange or particularly inspiring or anything like that? Or anything about the altar setup? It was when you talked about prostration. I have a, Americans are not, we, our culture doesn't have any prostration in it. And when it does, it's you're bowing down to somebody you're going to fear. So that picture comes up right away. Yeah. And so I, I always say, well, move on. I know who you are. Go away. And what I, what the big thing I took away from the presentation yesterday was that these are all um, solutions mm -hmm. to karma. The word yeah. is like, keeps me at the moment, but all this is for our benefit and our ability to move things out of our space and move on so yeah yeah that's a really nice summary I like that yeah prostration is a tricky one and it's one of those ones where once you take it on board it starts to become so natural that you forget how weird it is <laughs> and then you know your friends and family see you come into a gompa and you prostrate to the altar and they're like really all right <laughs> you know? 
but uh, yeah, it, it has a huge benefit once you get the background. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Christine, did you have one? This whole voicing thing was a big deal for me because I do everything in my head. Mm. I don't even, I don't even whisper it. <laughs> so mm. I did, I did all my sadness as, as best I could in all, and all this morning voicing them. And I did notice a difference mm. in, in voicing them. And so I wanted to thank you for that, to bringing that into my awareness. It was, it was just, there was just more, more presence. Yeah. I had more, more presence with the sadness in voicing them, even with a whisper. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad. And, you know, there's, as I said before, there's more necessity to verbalize pujas than sadhanas, but sadhanas allowed also is very powerful. And there was something my, my teacher said to me once years ago, where I'd spend enough time with him, I realized that he was always muttering something under his breath, like all the time, like he'd have his, you know, he'd have his mala beads out and he'd be doing something, or we'd been, be walking around and he would just be muttering something. And I'd listen really close and be like, I think he's doing Tara praises right now. <laughs> Right. Like he, and, and I said to him, I said, Geshla, what are you saying all the time? And he said, mouth never empty better, isn't it? Mouth never <laughs> empty. <laughs> and it was, it's so interesting because, you know, over the years I realized that any moment he's not talking, he's praying. He's doing a practice, a meditation or a mantra just all the time. And you know, I've known him for now 20 years and I've never seen him lose his temper ever. And I've, you know, traveled with him when you're all stressed and grubby and hungry and annoyed. You know, I've been in the same house with him for many days, you know, like seen him all day, every day at teachings. Like, I, you know, I know this person and he has never lost his temper in the 20 years I've known him. And I think, well, aside from any magical qualities that I can't prove but would like to think are there, that's impressive, <laughs> right? And, you know, the, the definition of a mantra is that which protects the mind, right? And it really does protect the mind from anger, attachment, jealousy, pride. It protects the mind. And when your mind is filled with positive and virtue, there's like no room for the negative to get in. And I think it would be easy for us to misunderstand this teaching and then say to ourselves, oh, well, I'll just be talking over the top of my own negative thoughts all the time in a kind of dissociative way or a repressive way or a suppressing way that could be really dangerous and not useful. But I think that we probably have enough common sense to know that's not the practice. The practice is to kind of proactively fill the mind with what's healthy and beneficial, not to suppress uncomfortable the feelings or to deny the fact that we do still get angry. It's kind of more preemptive strike. Does that make sense? You know, and then when you're grumpy, yes. know that you're grumpy, you know? When you're attached, know that you're attached. But if you're not, if you're right in there with a positive mental project, then those things don't have room to get in. Yes, and, and I've, when my mind goes negative, if I have the wherewithal to start a mantra, I've seen it just like that. Oh, yeah. Switch it just like that. I mean, yeah, it saves family dinners, right? It saves <laughs> staff meetings, right? Just a little Omani Pemi Hum under the breath, right in line, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. thank you. That's a, if I get nothing else, that's changed my life already. So thank oh, you. Oh, good. I'm glad. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Other thoughts. I mean, if you're in the airplane, you know, you don't have, you know, you can go back to doing it silently, right? You don't want to freak out your neighbors, but yeah. <laughs> I was just wondering what Dharmadhatu meant. Ah, yes. Um, all sentient beings who, although self and all appearances are Dharmadhatu by nature, have not realized it thus. That's the preamble to the four immeasurables prayer in the Medicine Buddha Puja. The Dharma Dhatu is referring to the lack of inherent existence. So, but to say Dharma Dhatu by nature is to say lacking inherent existence from the day. All right, well, if you remember other bits, um, uh, shout them out in the fullness of time. And uh, now we'll just kind of look at some more detail. Okay. So the prayers of each of the medicine Buddhas 
basically indicate what they're all about. So you don't have to overthink it. What's this one about? Just read the prayer of each of them that you find in the Sadhana. So for example, Medicine Buddha, renowned glorious king of excellent signs. He's, this prayer is, may we be free from epidemics, execution, criminals, and spirits. Have faculties fully complete, meaning all of our sense faculties. Have the continuum of suffering and negativities cut, not fall to lower realms, experience the happiness of humans and gods, with hunger, thirst, and poverty pacified, may there be wealth, without torments of bodies such as bindings and beatings, without harm of tigers, lions, and snakes, with conflict pacified, endowed with loving minds, and relieved from fear of floods as well, may we pass to fearless bliss. So the prayers that renowned glorious King of Excellent Signs made when he was still a bodhisattva were related to these particular issues. And of course, every other kind of suffering there is and every kind of benefit you want to have, but these in particular. So when you see things like have faculties fully complete and you know it's referring to being born with good vision, good hearing, um, you know, limbs that work, our modern sensibility might say, isn't that a bit prejudice? Or isn't that a bit looking down on people with disabilities or somehow saying that they're less than? And in no way is it saying that every sentient being has put a nature, but it's an important question to arise. Like we have our famous Shanti Deva prayer that we say all the time, may the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds, right? And it can be kind of triggering. And when I first um, read it, I immediately thought of my godfather who is blind and is a, you know, sort of a blind advocate and activist. And he would say, even if he could see tomorrow, he wouldn't want to. His whole life and identity is built around the fact that he can't see and his community is developed in that way. And there's huge benefits to him because he's blind. You know, it's a great presumption to think that he would want to see forms, right, for example. So when you're reading things like this, read it with the objectivity that asks why. And in the commentaries, you'll find the point is about independence. So historically, if you couldn't see, it was very hard to be independent and access teachings. You know, Braille wasn't existing in all languages. Um, wasn't easy to access. People were not as kind to people with disabilities necessarily in all cultures in the past. And, you know, there was a lot of heaviness around not being physically ideal, whatever that means, that kind of nonsense. So what's being said is independence, right? We want to be born with the kind of circumstances physically and situationally which allow independent movement to be able to seek out and practice teachings. So if you're blind and you can seek out and practice teachings, no worries. You know what I mean? And, you know, similarly, like even in the Medicine Buddha Sutra, I think one of the prayers is, may I never be reborn as a woman, right? And then all of us are like, hey, right? And similarly, it's about safety and independence from the time at which these sutras were created. So it's in no way looking down on women. It's saying, because men get weird, especially in the past, it's harder to be a girl, right? It's less safe, not because of being a girl, but because of men's attitudes towards girls, right? Bless them, the patriarchy, Arr, right? And also that, you know, in the past, things like menstruation and pregnancy were a bit more of a hassle to manage. And there were less strategies to support people in those stages for it to, again, allow for independence and safety. So now we have independence and safety. There's still dodginess about, right, from various sentient beings, but it's not necessarily a negative rebirth to be reborn as a woman because the benefit is that we're conditioned for compassion to be allowable, right? Poor fellas to have a compassionate heart and behavior is not as socially acceptable as it is for women. So if men want to practice Dharma in a rich and full way and become kinder, more compassionate people, that is a brave man going against type, right? Going against societal norms. That is a very secure individual. 
So there's in a way more benefit to being born as a woman nowadays. So it's not about men and women. It's not about disabled or not disabled. It's not about any of those things. It's about praying for conditions that are conducive to practice at our level. Eventually our conditions won't even matter, right? But at our level, we're acknowledging that if we were destitute and had horrible poverty, if we were in the middle of a famine or a war, at our level, it would be harder for us to practice. Once we're more advanced, those same conditions might even amplify our practice. But when you're doing these prayers for medicine Buddhas, you're acknowledging where you are and saying, while I'm at this level, may I have things that hold and support me moving further. Um, yeah, Skylar, go ahead. Um, I think you kind of just answered it, but um, I was kind of wondering if maybe this was personal obstacles that they went through themselves. Like Tara, she was obviously a female and she vowed from what I've heard to always be a female to prove to them that females could become Buddhas. And so I'm kind of wondering if maybe, you know, this Buddha was, was disabled in a way and was like, you know, this is what I struggled with and this is what I always want, you know, people to know that they're not alone mm -hmm. or, you know, that there is hope. I don't know, maybe that didn't Yeah, make sense. Yeah, I think it's really likely. I think it's really likely. I haven't um, seen a good commentary that goes into the elaborate history of each one prior to their enlightenment. And of course, after a fashion, we're talking about like archetypal energy. So any Buddha could manifest as medicine Buddha or manifest as Tara because the enlightened mind is genderless and gender full, but they take these aspects to be relatable to us, right? Um, but whoever the being was that was like the quote, the first, you know, renowned glorious king of excellent signs, medicine Buddha or whoever, their life story, I would be, um, you know, probably you're quite right that those were some of the very hardships that they wanted others to not have because they themselves had felt them. Absolutely. And, and, you know, think about like, who will you be when you're a Buddha? Who will be the ones that you reach and the ones that you connect with? You know, there's going to be some like Buddhas that are particularly helpful for like messy divorces <laughs> or like some Buddhas particularly helpful with, you know, like tyrant bosses or, you know, like it's going to be related, uh, yeah, to your own trauma and transformation, no doubt. Those will be the sentient beings you particularly connect and relate to for sure or who relate to you. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know 100% because I haven't read their life stories, but I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. Okay. So, renowned glorious king of excellent signs, amazing and fantastic. Then we have um, king of melodious sound, brilliant radiance of skill, adorned with jewels, moon and lotus. So, his prayer is about, may we have wealth and goods of humans and gods without torment at conception, be always born human, because being reborn as a human is the most conducive for the spiritual path, or being reborn in a pure land, of course. Never be separated from bodhicitta. Increase in virtuous dharma. Purify obscurations. Gain the happiness of humans and gods. May we be freed from being separated from the spiritual guide from dark ages, spirit harm, death and enemies, and from the dangers of isolated places. May we have enthusiasm for making offerings and rituals. May lesser beings have samadhi, mindfulness, strength, the dharani of non-forgetfulness, and attain supreme wisdom. May tormenting fires be cooled. So when you see, may lesser beings have samadhi, mindfulness, strength, the dharani of non-forgetfulness, et cetera, when we're saying lesser beings, we mean less mature in the spiritual path, not lower or less than. Yeah, we're just meaning less mature on the spiritual path with the absolute ability to develop because we all do. So, you know, these, these kind of hierarchical kind of um, terms, again, can be triggering. Just remember that we're all equal in having Buddha nature and all of us will equally become Buddhas in the future. We're not talking about like a 
inherent quality that some people have and others don't. So then we have stainless excellent gold, great jewel who accomplishes all vows. May the short-lived gain longevity, the poor full wealth. May combatants come to have loving minds. May we not be without training and fall to the lower realms, but be bound by our vows and never without bodhicitta. So of course, right now with all of the conflict in the world, this may combatants come to have loving minds. This is a thought we have all the time, but if we're doing prayers directed to stainless, excellent gold, great jewel who accomplishes all vows, the momentum and the energy behind that phrase is more. So we can kind of link our aspirations with his ability and maybe there's more power for our prayers. Then we have Medicine Buddha, Supreme Glory, Free from Sorrow. For all sentient beings such as ourselves, may sorrow and the like always be pacified and life be long and happy. May the conqueror's light increase bliss and joy in the hells. May we have brightness, beauty, and wealth be unharmed by spirits. May we have love for each other and may there be no disease. So Supreme Glory Free from Sorrow is very much about relief from mental illness. Um, it's about kind of sparking joy like Marie Kondo would say, but there's something very beautiful about consciously wishing for this and that we have love for each other, that there be no disease. And so, you know, really thinking about what's gonna, what's gonna remind you of the sorrow of sentient beings? Is it thinking about people that have been isolated because of the pandemic for many, you know, months, years, and how their social anxiety might have increased because of that, or just the depression that comes from not connecting with your fellow man? and how much more pervasive that is than before the pandemic that you know kind of letting the poignancy of that touch you but then feeling empowered to help shift that energy by directing prayers in this way so rather than be kind of oppressed by the suffering you see you become lifted and empowered to kind of do something about it when you think about buddhas of this type and then melodious ocean of proclaimed dharma Hey, we always have perfect view and faith. So perfect view, meaning understanding the emptiness of inherent existence, understanding the profundity of karma, cause and effect, and the conclusion of all that being, may we practice the ethics of non-harmfulness. May we practice altruism in this life and every single life. For our sake, for the sake of others, may we always have perfect view and faith. May we hear the sound of Dharma, be enriched with bodhicitta. For the sake of resources, may we give up negativity, because at our level, we need resources. May wealth increase. May we abide in lo love, have long lives, and be content. And then Medicine Buddha, delightful king of clear knowing, supreme wisdom of an ocean of Dharma. So mind of profound Dharma wisdom, difficult to fathom, sporting in the pure sphere of truth, one who sees all knowable objects directly I prostrate. So may the distracted be free of malice and rich in goods. So we can all think of people who are distracted and full of malice and have kind of a deprivation mentality. So we're really consciously directing our prayers in this way. May they be free of malice and rich in goods. May those on evil paths to the lower realms attain the 10 virtues. Why? Because then they won't hurt themselves, then they won't hurt others. May those controlled by others gain perfect independence, right? So all people who are oppressed by their governments, oppressed by their family, oppressed by their spouses, oppressed in any number of ways where they don't have independence, may they find that and all have long life, hear the names, meaning the names of the medicine Buddhas, et cetera, and be virtuous. And then medicine Buddha, King of Lapis or Sapphire Light, Bhagavan with equal compassion for all, et cetera. We say, may those attracted to mistaken and lesser paths enter Mahayana and all be beautified by their vows. 
May we be free from pain caused by immorality, be complete in faculties and without disease and have abundant goods. May those disillusioned with the weakest conditions always have powerful faculties. May we be freed from Mara's noose and perverse viewpoints. So Mara's noose, you know, meaning the habit of negativity, the habit of wrong views, the temptation of the objects that trigger afflictions. And we want to be free from perverse viewpoints like those that lead to harming ourselves and others. May those tormented by kings gain bliss. We can think those tormented by unfortunate prime ministers, unfortunate presidents, unfortunate leaders of all kinds, may they gain bliss. And those who support themselves out of hunger or through negativity out of hunger be satisfied with food received in accordance with the Dharma. May hardships of heat and cold be pacified and all good wishes be fulfilled. Endowed with morality that pleases the Aryas, may we be liberated. So that's the last of them. Um, do, you, do you have any thoughts about the eight medicine Buddhas? We, we just went through seven. When we say eight, we're adding Shakyamuni Buddha to the list. Um, yeah, Christine, go ahead. You talk about maybe praying to whatever uh, medicine Buddha we, we may need what they represent and what they bring. How do you pray to an individual medicine Buddha? Well, you can just do the prayer that's in the puja. You can just, just that like, prayer. You can just, just say that yeah. prayer. Okay. Or, the ones that... Yeah. Or um, think of their name and then do the regular medicine Buddha mantra. So think of the name of that Buddha that helps with those things. And then just tie it home. Bekenze, bekenze, ma, bekenze, bekenze, raja, samogate, soha. Okay. Um, when you're doing prayers, you know, we, we have all of our associations from whatever religions we were brought up in or around. And when we hear things like pray to and blessings, we have to remember the Buddhist connotation because it's a little different. Prayers in Buddhism are a lot more like aspirations that we remind ourselves of and ways of opening to the support that's already there. It's not saying, please save me. You high holy one, me low, lowly one. It's not that. It's saying, I'm open to the support you're already giving and I aspire to the qualities you already have. Yeah, so you're basically saying, may I become the medicine Buddha for all of the people I have strong karmic connection with. May there be a ripple effect of health around me. May I enact these deeds just as they did. So, you know, you're praying to them for support, but in praying to them for support, it's more just clearing the obstacles to feeling the pre-existing support there. And when you say blessings, may, may blessings rain upon me, it's not being sprinkled with pixie dust. A blessing is that which transforms the mind. It's the critical mass of development of merit and positive karma that leads to a real shift, yeah? A shift in perspective, a shift into a realization. It's a little bit like the feeling you get when the penny drops about something you've known many, many years, but suddenly you get it deeply. That's a blessing. And the Buddha didn't give it to you. The Buddha was a condition for you to connect with it yourself, yeah? So, you know, it's really, again and again, the Buddhas are offering tools or offering medicine for our own development and our own health. And they only work if we take them and use them correctly. And taking them and using them correctly doesn't mean they were the thing that fixed us. We already had the potential for health. We just needed some support and some tools to facilitate that. Do you know what I mean? So we don't want to ever get into a disempowering headspace with prayers or asking for blessings. It's always a collaboration. It's always a meeting of minds. And that's, so, you, you know what I mean? That's really different than what I was brought up with to think about prayer. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, it's really different. So yeah. thank you for sharing that. That'll yeah. take a little bit of work. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, for all of us. But you know, when like for example, when you're doing Omane Pemehum, right, the classic compassion wisdom mantra, you're asking that compassionate wisdom come to you, but also from you. You're connecting with the essence of compassionate wisdom. And by stimulating compassionate wisdom within yourself because you want it there you also become open to whatever compassionate wisdom is quote outside of yourself coming in. You know, you become lots more kind of like a, an osmosis or, you know, some sort of permeable membrane where it becomes um, like the positive kind of a vicious circle, right? Where it's like self-reinforcing. Your compassionate wisdom invites compassionate wisdom and that in compassionate wisdom that was invited reinforces yours. And it just becomes this powerful cycle of more and more and more of it. And you being the catalyst of just saying, compassionate wisdom is important. Om mani peme hum triggers the whole process. So you were the one that started it. They weren't sprinkling pixie dust on you. However, something about the enlightened mind might have inspired you to say it in the first place, you know? So it's, it can be a little chicken or the egg, but um, I guess the point of all this is to say, don't feel like you're a passive participant in your own awakening. You are not being bestowed with enlightenment. You are enlightening yourself. And part of enlightening yourself is asking for the tools to do that. All right, so then uh, why do Medicine Buddha practices? <laughs> um, you know, obviously there are many reasons, but why Medicine Buddha particularly? The classic is of course, progress on the path to enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. But Medicine Buddha practices act to both purify negative karma, accumulate merit and develop skill in meditation, as well as supporting a long and healthy life in which to practice deeply and well. So all Kriya Tantra or lower Tantra practices do this, but Medicine Buddha is particularly effective during what is called the degenerate age. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So you want a long and healthy life because you want to practice and keep the momentum you started, not just to have a long and healthy life for a long retirement to go skydiving or whatever. Like do that, have fun, whatever. But the point of a long and healthy life is to have more time to practice deeply and well so that you immediately pick up where you left off in your next life. Then the other reason is to assist others on their path by being a powerful condition for them. So we're not a cause of anyone's suffering. We're not a cause of anyone's happiness, but we are a powerful condition for people. So people who are ill or actively dying are particularly benefited by medicine Buddha practices, as well as animals and other beings in lower realms. So there's a strong karmic connection with medicine Buddha and the dying and people in the intermediate state, as well as animals and beings in the lower realms. So we can direct our practice towards them and help bring out the best in them. So then um, Pabonga Rinpoche, the great enlightened being Pabonga Dechen Ningpo said that in such a degenerate time, Medicine Buddha, which is lower Tantra and Haruka, who is highest yoga Tantra are two very precious deities to practice. When the time is very degenerate, with an explosion of the five degenerations. So the degenerate time is basically a time in which a fully fledged uh, supreme Nirmanakaya form of a Buddha has passed away and a new one hasn't revealed themselves because the karma of sentient beings hasn't ripened. So for us, Shakyamuni Buddha existed, his teachings still exist, but he is not alive in that form accessible as a human being right now. So we're in a time of degeneration and during times of degeneration, delusions become stronger and harder to abandon. Uh, the degeneration of sentient beings means that they are more and more thick skulled and more and more difficult to subdue. Degeneration of time means there are more wars, sicknesses, 
new diseases coming and so forth. Degeneration of life means lifespan starts becoming shorter and shorter. And degeneration of view means that people are very easily believe wrong views, find it difficult to believe the right view, and only a small number of people believe in karma or understand emptiness. So the degenerate age has these five degenerations. And you know, it's it is bad news. Like things are gonna get worse, they will continue to get worse for quite some time, and then they'll get better again, right? And this is we see this from history, right? The pendulum swings back and forth from dark age to renaissance to dark age to renaissance. And none of it is forever, but in a time of degeneration, doing prayers towards Haruka or Medicine Buddha are particularly effective because they knew this was coming and they put tons of energy into practices relating to beings during these times. So it's kind of like we ride the coattails of the energy they already started. And I guess the good news about the degenerate time is Whenever you do something that is positive, that is on the spiritual path, the karma is huge because so much is stacked against you to do negativity. Whenever you do something beneficial, it's very powerful. It's said that during the time of the Buddha, when people did positive actions, it was kind of just like their default setting. Of course they do positive actions, they're around the Buddha. It's a lovely time of love and light, you know? It was an age of Aquarius and whatnot, right? But, um, you know, now, how easy is it to do negativity? How hard is it to do the spiritual path? So when you do do the spiritual path, feel very happy that the conditions came together for that to happen and know that the weight of that positive karma is huge. So, you know, I think it's useful for us to think, okay, what's a good scenario for me? If I die right now, one, you know, a best case scenario is that I take another human rebirth. Maybe I get reborn in a pure land, but let's hope for a perfect human rebirth. It's gonna be on a hotter, angrier planet. Yeah, it's going to be a much more chaotic planet with a lot more disease and disorders. So even if I am reborn a human, even if I do meet the Dharma, it's going to be harder conditions. So what does that make me think? I need to develop my mind now so that I have the resilience and the tools to cope with a hotter, angrier planet. Yeah, if I'm lucky enough to get reborn as a human being next time. Yeah, that's like the best case scenario. And it's still a bit like, oh, gosh, right? Um, hopefully, I'll become enlightened in one life. But you know, I got to tell you, a lot of conditions have to come together for that to happen. And I'm not holding my breath, right? <laughs> so, you know, maybe I'll get another human rebirth. And that would be fantastic. I hope so. But I better also come with the tools to deal with it well. Yeah, and to not kind of backslide as the result of these difficult conditions. But Say, you know, the world goes down the toilet, you know, it all ends in flames, it's a big disaster apocalypse. It's all right, there'll be another planet, sentient beings will continue, you know. But sentient beings suffer so much now, we really want to do what we can to get more sentient beings out of suffering as quickly as possible. Therefore, our own enlightenment is quite a vital project to pursue. So you're just having that balance of being motivated, being engaged, but not panicked and not kind of pressured. Yeah, um, Mary, go ahead. Um, I've kind of wondered about exactly what degenerate times mean. So that's a little different than what I was thinking. Um, I guess I was wondering if it has to do with the whole universal cosmology and like an imploding universe or the end of the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. And is it, you know, another Big Bang that creates a, a new age or is it, it's, like you said, it's the birth of a Buddha. So that's a very different way than I was thinking about it. Does that have any yeah. relationship? And then what does Kali Yuga mean? Kriya Yoga. Kriya Yoga? What are you saying? Kali Yuga, like a big age, or a, I've heard that term. I, I'm um, not totally sure um, what what term you're saying, um, but certainly it's a it's a Buddhist view that there was a big bang, but there will be another, you know, and that the universe is always expanding and contracting like a heartbeat. And more and more quantum physicists um, say similar things. So 
you know, yes, the big bang, but it was not necessarily the first or the last. So certainly there's that, you know, view that the universe expands and contracts and stuff like that happens. But the degenerate age as a term in Buddhist terminology just means a time after a supreme nirmanakaya has passed. Okay. Um, and so the next Buddha will be, uh, you know, who shows supreme nirmanakaya form in an accessible way that beings can see as a full Buddha will be Maitreya, right. the Buddha of loving kindness who's right now in uh, Tashita heaven, still, you know, supporting the cause, but um, we haven't been able to meet him in person yet. Mm -hmm. Hey, thank you. Yeah, 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 sorry, I didn't know that term. All right, so um, degenerate age, there we go. And then we get the mantra and um, the mantra of Medicine Buddha is, it means what you would expect it to mean in terms of healing, but there's some specificity that's kind of good to know. Um, the common pronunciation is Tayata, Om, Bekenze, Bekenze, Maha Bekenze, Bekenze, Radza Samugate Soha. So, you know, everybody's going to say it slightly different. There's the very precise Sanskrit way. There's the very Tibetan accented way. The best thing you can do is to try and say it the way your own teacher has said it, and then just connect with a strong kind of faith and proceed and not get too tight about perfecting the pronunciation. You just kind of do your best and let go. Um, maybe this is something to read later. It's a bit verbose, but it's some context um, about the medicine Buddhas. Um, the short mantra basically, Tayata means this contains or it is thus. And Om composed of a, u, and ma, um, signifies pure holy body, holy speech, and holy mind of the Buddha, here referring to those of the medicine Buddha. The actualizing the whole path to enlightenment purifies our impure body, speech, and mind, and transforms them into medicine Buddha's pure holy body, holy speech, and holy mind. We can then become a perfect guide for living beings. With our omniscient mind, we are able to effortlessly, directly, and unmistakably see the level of every living being and all the methods that fit them in order to lead them to the peerless happiness of full enlightenment. So this is from Lama Zopa Rinpoche's book, The Power of Mantra, which is really excellent. I recommend it. So this is how Bekenze is written in the kind of Sanskritized English. And it, you know, you would not know it is pronounced Bekenze by looking at it that way. But Bekenze means the elimination of pain. And Maha Bekenze means the great elimination of pain. So in one explanation of the mantra, the first Bekenze refers to the elimination of pain of true suffering, first noble truth. The pain, not just of disease, but all of the problems of body and mind. It also eliminates the pain of death and rebirth, that which is caused by karma and delusions. The second Bekenze refers to eliminating all the true causes of suffering, so the second noble truth, which are not external, but within the mind. This refers to the karma and delusions themselves, the inner causes then enable external factors to become conditions for disease. The third Bekenze, Maha Bekenze, or great elimination of pain, refers to eliminating even the subtle imprints left on the consciousness by the delusions. And these subtle imprints are part of what prevents our full omniscience, which we need to be a complete Buddha in order to see the minds of beings and help them perfectly. So we want even the subtle imprints removed. And the fourth Bekenze is optional. Some texts have it, others don't. But His Holiness the Dalai Lama recites it with the fourth Bekenze. So then there's um, another way of looking at it, which is the Medicine Buddha Mantra actually contains the remedy of the whole graduated path to enlightenment, the Lamrim, from beginning up to the peerless happiness of full enlightenment. So in this context, then the first Bekenze contains the graduated path of the lower capable being, the second Bekenze, the graduated path of the middle capable being, Maha Bekenze, the graduated path of the higher capable being. 
So the lower capable being, their motivation is to have another perfect human rebirth in order to continue their spiritual path. The middle capable being, their goal is to achieve nirvana, the state beyond sorrow, to end suffering. The higher capable being's goal is complete enlightenment, Buddhahood, in order to benefit all sentient beings. So we need practices related to all three scopes. Reciting the mantra leaves imprints on our mind, positive imprints, so that we're able to actualize the path contained in the mantra. So the simple visualization during mantra recitation time is the mantra standing upright around a moon disk, radiating light, sending light out and gathering it back in, purifying yourself and all sentient beings, sending out offerings to all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and bringing back blessings. So basically it's just light going out, light coming in, light going out, light coming in. And the characters of the mantra here are in Tibetan script, but if it's easier for you to visualize them in English characters or whatever is your mother tongue, that's completely fine. They just need to represent the correct sound. And if seeing the individual syllables is too hard, you can just have a general impression of blueness. That's fine too. And here are the recommended readings um, that I mentioned yesterday. So again, ultimate healing, the power of mantra and teachings from the Medicine Buddha retreat. All three are by Lama Zopa Rinpoche and um, they're super useful. Yeah, okay. So I'll see you in 10 minutes.